In this video, we're going to talk about Chapter 2, Section 2.3, Atomic Structure and Symbolism, okay, which is probably the largest section in Chapter 2. And we've got really some key ideas in this section in regard to understanding the periodic table and the information that that provides us about individual elements on there. So let's dive into it, Atomic Structure and Symbolism. Some information that we know from our prior videos, right? The nucleus contains the majority of the atom's mass. That's where all the protons and neutrons are. Those have appreciable mass, whereas electrons do not. Right? But the volume of the atom is really occupied by the electron clouds. So you've got this tiny little nucleus in the middle of an atom surrounded by a cloud of electrons that take up most of the volume. Okay. There you see some comparative numbers. Diameter of an atom is 10 to the negative 10 meters, okay, or an angstrom is that unit, 10 to the negative 10 meters. And the diameter of the nucleus is 100,000 times smaller. Right? So just a fraction of a percent is taken up by the nucleus. If you think about yourself as being in a standard size classroom, the nucleus would be like the size of the tip of your pencil. Or if you're in the Bill Stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a blueberry right in the middle some examples that are used in your textbook. Kind of crazy to think about just how small this thing is, but it has just about all the mass. So with these small things that we're working with, what kind of units do we use? Because obviously we need the proper unit to measure this thing. Small atoms, small subatomic particles, right? 10 to the minus 23 grams, small charges. So what new units do we get? We get the fundamental unit of charge there on the bottom, and the atomic mass unit, atomic mass unit abbreviated as AMU, is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams, and it's based on carbon-12, right? the most common isotope of carbon, carbon-12. We assign that a mass of 12 AMU, and that's where we get our masses from. And then our charge on the electrons, fundamental unit of charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. You don't necessarily need to know those conversions for this class. You do need to know how to work with AMUs and what they represent. So here we see a comparison of our subatomic particles. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. Electrons have a negative charge, a fundamental unit of charge. So that's all right. We should be good with that. Protons and neutrons, as we see here, I've already stated it have a mass of just about one AMU. You can assume that to be one atomic mass unit. And then electrons, as you see, much, much smaller, about 1,800 times smaller. And so that's why we say electrons don't have appreciable mass. But now the big question from this video is how do we find the numbers of each of these things in an element? We want to be able to look at a chemical symbol and determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So the periodic table will give us that information. Starting with the atomic number, right? That's the first thing we're gonna look at because the atomic number, which just increases sequentially as you move across the periodic table like a book. Atomic number of one for hydrogen, two for helium, three for lithium, and so on. That's the number of protons. Then we use the atomic mass of each element to figure out the number of neutrons. Okay. So let's jump into that. The atomic number, which we sometimes represent by the symbol Z, it tells us the number of protons. We get it directly from the periodic table. And a key idea is the fact that this is the defining trait of an element, okay? The symbol corresponds to the atomic number or vice versa, the atomic number corresponds to the symbol. You cannot change that. If you change the atomic number, you change the element that you're dealing with, okay? Carbon, for example, always has six protons. If you change that, from six to seven, you have a different element, or eight, or 34. It's always a different element, okay. which is what we're talking about. We can change neutrons. Those are called isotopes. We can change electrons. Those are called ions. But the same number of protons always in the type of atom that we're dealing with. So that's how we figure out protons. Atomic number is equal to the number of protons. What about neutrons? Okay. Oh, sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. I read neutral. I was determining neutrons. 
or we're looking at electrons first on this slide, number 36. Okay. Now, if something is neutral, meaning it doesn't have a charge, that means that the number of positive charges and negative charges have to be counteracting one another. Okay. Now, we just said the number of protons we get from the atomic number. So if something is neutral, those protons, which are positively charged, has to equal the number of electrons that are negatively charged. So if and only if we're neutral, then the atomic number would also tell us the number of electrons. And in this course, if you're not given a charge, you assume that something is neutral. If I don't give you a charge, you assume that it's neutral, so protons would be equal to electrons. That's not always going to be the case because we'll talk about ions in just a second. Okay. So that's how we figure out electrons. What about neutrons? Now we got that. We get that information from the mass number. And it's not the mass number straight up, okay? So we're looking at the mass number, the atomic mass. And what that represents is the sum of what we said just a minute ago, the things that have appreciable mass, protons and neutrons. Okay? So the mass number represents the protons and neutrons. The atomic number, Z, represents the number of protons. So I take the mass number, A, and I subtract out the atomic number Z, and that gives me the number of neutrons. Okay, so I take the mass number minus the atomic number. If you're not given a mass number, you assume you deal with whatever the most common isotope is. Okay. But if you look at those mass numbers on the periodic table, they're not whole numbers. Okay. Carbon, for example, is 12.01. What those are are weighted averages. And you're not going to get fractions of a proton or fractions of a neutron. So what you need to do is take that number and round it to the nearest whole number, the mass number. Okay, so take the mass number, round it to the nearest whole number, right, 12.01, that's easy, it rounds to one, 12. Subtract out the atomic number, and then you have your number of neutrons. So what would that look like here? Okay, easy example problem to get going. What are the atomic number and mass number? Okay. The atomic number right here, always a whole number, six. The mass number down here, 12. We round it to the most common isotope. So that tells me I have six protons for carbon, and then I do 12, the mass number, minus six, the atomic number. 12 minus six is also equal to six neutrons in carbon, 12. So what about those ions that I alluded to before? Okay. If the number of protons and electrons are not equal, that means our positive charge is not perfectly counteracting our negative charge. So we have something that's electrically charged overall. That's called an ion. Okay. And we determine the charge by just taking the number of protons minus the number of electrons. They're no longer equal. So sometimes something will have a positive charge. Other times it can have a negative charge. And that's always done by losing or gaining electrons. That's the only way to make something charged because remember, we can't change the number of protons. If we change the number of protons, we change the chemical identity. So when we create ions for things, we're gaining or losing electrons. And those two types of ions have different names. Okay? We're starting with something that's negatively charged. If it has an abundance of electrons, got extra electrons hanging around more than it does the number of protons, then it has an overall net negative charge. And we call that an ion. And that's a term you have to know, we'll use it all the time moving forward. An anion, negatively charged ion. Okay, make sure that's in your notes. For example, neutral oxygen has eight electrons and eight protons. But oxygen always forms an ion, not always, often forms an ion where it has a negative two charge. And it does that by having 10 electrons and eight protons. Okay, so eight protons minus 10 electrons is negative two. Oxygen has a minus two charge. What's the flip side of that? If we have more protons than we do electrons, we have an overall positive charge, and that's called a cation. And I have a little trick down here. You can just think about the fact that cation, the T, looks like positive charge. We see that with sodium all the time, very often. Right? Sodium 
has 11 protons and 11 electrons when it's neutral, but it frequently loses one of those electrons. So it has 11 protons, 10 electrons, which gives us an overall plus one charge. So here we can do this one in the review session or in our lecture discussions. Pick any ion, make it up, and then figure out the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You'll have some practice on sampling for that as well. So what other information do we have in our chemical symbols? Well, we haven't talked about the letters a whole lot, right? Other than the fact that they tie into the atomic number, the number of protons. The chemical symbols are abbreviations that we use for the elements. We can also use them to represent individual atoms or a container of a lot of atoms. Okay. So the one example on this slide is mercury. The symbol is Hg. And some of them make sense, right? carbon being C, for example. Others don't make a lot of sense right away. Like why is iron Fe? because some of them are derived from the name of the element in other languages. Most of our symbols have one or two letters. Some of the real heavy ones have three letter symbols that those are placeholders until they get official names. But the key thing, the capitalization is important. If you have a two letter symbol like HG for mercury, you have to capitalize the first letter, that's gonna be uppercase, and the lower, the second letter is going to be lowercase. You have to do that, right? If you can't do capital H, capital G. For sodium, the symbol is N A. It has to be capital N, lowercase A. That's key. People, you know, if you've got sloppy handwriting or sloppy typing, make sure you're paying attention to that. It has to be uppercase, lowercase. Here we see a bunch of examples of those. Okay. And then here you see some notes where some of these names came from. A lot of them are in Latin. There's iron right there, named of ferrum. So that's, we talked about the symbol. We talked about changing the number of electrons. What about changing the number of neutrons? Okay. That gives us something called an isotope. Okay. Now keep in mind, we're always going to have the same number of protons because that ties into the chemical identity. But we can change the number of neutrons. You've heard of carbon-13, for example. That's a less common isotope of carbon. Carbon-12 is the most common. There's also carbon-14. So if we are representing isotopes, right, looking at these symbols, we put the mass number as a superscript to the left of the element symbol. So the superscript means it's small and raised up a little bit. right? So it's small up and to the left. And that's not to be confused with the atomic number, which also sometimes appears to the left, but it is a subscript, meaning it goes down below. So if we take magnesium, for example, there are three possible isotopes of magnesium. Magnesium-24, magnesium-25, magnesium-26. That's how you say that when you see the symbols. You say the name and then the isotope mass number. Yep. And I already alluded to this. Magnesium always has... 12 protons, that's the atomic number from the periodic table, but it can have a different number of electrons, or if it's charged, or a different number of neutrons if it's an isotope. And this slide shows us where everything goes. Mass number as a superscript to the left, charge as a superscript to the right, and atomic number, which you don't have to show because you can figure it out from the periodic table once you have the symbol, but if you're using it, it goes as a subscript to the left. And you have to put these in the right places. You can't just put them randomly. It's kind of the, speaking the language of chemistry. And here we see some examples of isotopes of hydrogen. Right? Each one has one proton, but they have different numbers of neutrons. Three different isotopes of hydrogen. And again, the mass that's represented on the periodic table, the 1.008 that you'll see, is the weighted average of all of these isotopes. So what does that mean? Okay. If we're looking at atomic mass, all of our protons and neutrons have a mass of about one AMU, 
and we're going to think about the electrons as being negligible. It's a safe assumption in this class. So the, we're thinking about the atomic mass being equal to its mass number, keeping in mind that it's a weighted average of all the isotopes that are present, that are naturally occurring, found on Earth. So how is that calculated? If the average mass is equal to the sum of the fractional abundance multiplied by the isotopic mass. So how much is present, naturally abundant, in fraction form, multiplied by that individual mass? And you do need to know how to do these calculations. Okay. So if we take boron, for example, there's two isotopes, boron 10 and boron 11. Okay. So we put those percentages in fractional form and multiplied them by their respective atomic masses and sum them together. So 0.199, right, and I'm just getting these numbers by dividing the percentages by 100, multiply them by their respective atomic masses, and add them together. And if I look on the periodic table, that's the weighted average that I see for boron, 10.81. But no individual boron has an atomic mass of 10.8 AMUs. Right? It's a mixture of boron 10 and boron 11, which is a key idea, and you do have to know how to do this. Okay. If you see something on the periodic table that is just a whole number, that means that that thing is radioactive, and the periodic table is just showing you the atomic mass of the most abundant isotope. Okay. So we finish with a couple of examples, right? You should pause and try these on your own. We can also go over them in the review session. Sample of magnesium contains three isotopes, right, with their respective atomic masses. So you should pause this and try it. Think about the method. Take those percentages, divide them by 100 to get them in fractional form, multiply them each by their respective atomic masses, and then add them together. So I recommend you pause the video and try this. You should get a final answer of 24.31 AMU, 24.31. Where do these come from, these numbers? It's a technique known as mass spectrometry. Okay. This is something that's not tested. You will, if you continue on to organic chemistry, learn all about this method. Okay, but the process known as mass spectrometry can figure out just how much of each atom is present and their abundance for each isotope. And then there is one last example here. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons are found in a sample of potassium-39 with a positive charge? So how do I do this? I recommend first you pause and try it. And then when you've thought about it, come back and I'll give you the answer. Protons, neutrons, and electrons in potassium 39. Number of protons is the easiest, right? It's equal to the atomic number, 19 protons in potassium, no matter what. How many neutrons? Well, it's potassium 39. That's the mass number, okay? So to get the number of neutrons, I take the Mass number, 39, minus the atomic number, 19. 39 minus 19, and I have 20 neutrons in this sample. What about electrons? Okay. Well, if potassium were neutral, it would be equal to the number of protons, but it's not, right? It's positively charged. So that means I have an extra proton. We said that potassium had 19 protons, and if it has one extra, because it has a plus one charge, that means we must have 18 electrons. So 19 protons, 20 neutrons, and 18 electrons in this example. And you should know how to do that for any example that I would give you using the periodic table as a tool. That's the key idea from this chapter, as well as knowing how to do what isotopes are, what ions are, cations and anions, and how to calculate those abundances, the math problems that we were just looking at.